Good afternoon, everybody. I have one thing that I want to ask you. And right now, the thing that I want to ask you is to wake up! Wake up! Because it's the Golden Mike episode 191 with Ozzy. I'm going to talk about who this <laughs> Ozzy person is because we just became <sighs> friends in like three minutes flat, I think, Ozzy. Um, but like, this is what we're going into today. Joy. Purpose. Spiritual connection. And how to awaken that. Um, Ozzy is the perfect person to have on. Ozzy, I can't believe you're on the show right now. People are giving you love, like George over there in Jer uh, in New York. George, it's good to see you. Uh, I, sm I smell some good things coming there from New York, um, George. Um, Ozzy, author of Beyond All Things. Ozzy is hosting a new podcast, Within All Things. I'm seeing the branding going on. Um, and she has... Like multiple, th she has like multiple degrees in all good things. Psychology, sociology, a doctorate in education. This is my type of person right here to have on the show. Now, Ozzy, do you know why we have, what are you laughing? Are you I'm laughing, crying, laughing, crying, and we haven't even started talking yet, Mark. This is good. <laughs> I, do you know why I've had 191 episodes? I feel, I feel like, like a number. number. No, you're not a number at all. I just, but, but you're not. You're not a number at all. I feel special. Just stop. But, but you know okay. why we, we've had 100, 191 episodes in the Golden Mic? I think it's so awesome because yeah. you're the real deal. Yeah, that's, that's why, Mark. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Because you cannot cancel me. I produce my own show, people. I, you can't cancel me. And especially because of the fact that <laughs> I'm Jorge Emilio's back. Jorge, where the hell have you been, you sucker MC? I took the show offline for three months because I didn't see you. It's good to see you again in Puerto Rico. Look at that shirt that he's... He's rocking right there. And look at that face on him. He's so serious. Can you see that, Ozzy? I'm not on Facebook right now. I'm oh, just okay. seeing you. So I'm going to take your word for it. Okay. Don't don't get on Facebook. I'm George not going just to. said, don't fall for it, Ozzy. He's going to yell at it. <laughs> He's going to yell at you. He's like, don't say it. Don't say it. You cannot cancel me. 191 episodes, which means in the next month, before 2020, we are going to reach 200 episodes of the Golden Mike Live. If you haven't met me yet, my name is Mark Cordone. I am the Chief Disruptive Officer of, put your hands up, the Joy Revolution. More importantly, I get to ask as a positive psychology coach, my friends, my family, a guest who is now a guest. Like, you used to watch the show and now you're actually on the show, Dr. Ozzy. Dr. Ozzy, I love it. This is the new show for you, Dr. Ozzy. Um, and the question is this, how happy are you today? And how much are you living in your full purpose? So I know we're going to talk about purpose, Dr. Ozzy, but how happy are you today? I know it's a double-barreled question. And how much are you living in your full purpose? It's so wild. I have the feeling where I'm like smiling so hard my face hurts. <laughs> So I'm, I'm, I feel, I feel really happy. I feel joyful. I feel great, happy to be here. And uh, I have a night off. My husband's amazing. He's like driving the kids around. We live in Israel and it's nighttime. He was like, oh, you're on a podcast with Mark Rodone. Leave the house. Go out. Do your thing. So this is like a night out for me. This is like three in one. I know what exactly happened. You go, honey, hubby. I need you to get the kids out of the damn house because there's a curse machine that's about to be like running wild in here. We need to we need to get that keep that bad spirit out. I get it, Doctor. No, Ozzy. totally not. Oh, totally not. So, <laughs> so um, I'm really happy to be here. And do I feel like I'm living my purpose? I feel like it's a constant work in progress. And as with anything in life, there's the ebb and there's the flow, and it's all there to keep us moving and and running in the right direction you know absolutely absolutely i love that you're here for those of you who are watching george emilio people on the replay people live if you're feeling good today and you're living in your full purpose don't be afraid to live in it don't be afraid to lean into it hit that heart let us know that you're alive Ozzy, I know you've had some things going over on over there in um, in Israel. Everything's safe, right? Safe and sound for now. 
So, yeah, you know, I, I, I felt safe even last week when things were a little crazy. It was the first time in the four years that we lived here, four and a half years, that I heard the, the uh, siren for missiles. Mm. And uh, it was last Tuesday morning. I woke up at like 6.15 and I was trying to meditate. And then I heard this like, ooh, and I thought to myself, wow, maybe the sirens didn't go off. We have this amazing defense system here that alerts us when these things happen. So they don't just happen and then you find out about it later. Like, you know, and you know what to do in the situation so you can stay safe. And I had this like fleeting moment of like, whoa, what if they forgot? And, and sure enough, they didn't forget. And this amazing system, it's called the Iron Dome, sets an anti-missile rocket up in the air and explodes the missile in midair so that it doesn't hit anyone. And I was kind of bummed I didn't get to see it. Wait, I so just heard you, it. So you heard the Iron Dome go off? I heard it. And there wow. were, I think, I think, unfortunately, there were like 500 missiles or something in the period of two days last week. So a lot of people heard it and saw it. And uh, it's wild. It's pretty surreal when you're in, when you're in it. And, and like, selfishly, I was just bummed that my kids didn't have school that day. They made the kids stay home from school. <laughs> Like, again, I, I, love the, uh, I, I love the fact that this gets to um, put me in a place of gratitude where I'm like, it's hard to even imagine things that you're describing right now. Because I'm like, the only time I've heard of an iron dome is when my mom, like, goes and says, son, you have an iron dome. Stop being so, like, <laughs> like stop being so hard-headed, right? But, like, the rest of it is, like, video game stuff to me. And that's, it's it's like that in a certain way. I think it's like that even when you're in it. You know, there's there's multiple levels. There's like the the jokes that go around that you know people use comedy to kind of keep things light, and then there's like the selfish wanting my kids to be in school and not home yeah. during the day, and then there's like the deeper level that's like I'm so grateful that I have such high level security in this country, and that. For most days out of the year, things are relatively quiet, and I live in a very safe country with high social trust, and mm -hmm. there's nowhere else I'd rather live. I, I live here on purpose, so I'm also grateful, as funny as that might sound. I don't think that it's funny at all. I mean, you're, you're Dr. Ozzy. There's nothing, there's nothing funny unless you make it funny, Dr. Ozzy. That's what you, why you had your kids leave today on us, and like, uh, we get to talk, talk. We get to talk about what's going on. Um, here's the other thing about positive psychology. I'm still doing my 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 shtick as people come in. <laughs> so no I love it. I love positive <laughs> psychology. We're so on the same page. So here's the other thing about it is, and I know you've studied um, Seligman's work and, and all the work of positive psychologists as someone who's been in the field of both positive psychology, education, and sociology. Um, a lot of people think that positive psychology is like 24/7. Happiness. There are no iron domes. There are, you know, we are in this, uh, we are in this uh, utopia where uh, Dr. Ozzy is riding around the world with her family, throwing Skittles out. No, wrong, wrong. Positive psychology really looks at how we make choices and look at opportunities through the ups, downs, and all arounds of life. Now, I didn't make it through my PhD program and you did. Is that right? Of okay, course, it's Mr. right, Dr. Ozzy, because it's my show. I tricked you twice. <laughs> Sorry, you have the TED degree going on for you. <laughs> you know, it's you, you just crack me up. And I think you're so right. I think that everything you're saying makes so much sense. And, and the positive psychology, I always remember the story from Tal Ben Shahar's book when he talks about, you know, he had the number one class at Harvard. He was a happiness professor. And one day it was it, like a, an assistant was following him around campus and, and helping him with everything he did. And the assistant said to him, wow, you know, Tal, I'm so happy I get to follow you around because I'm going to catch you being sad. I'm going to catch yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. And he was like, well, you will because I'm human and that is part of the buffet of emotions. The myriad emotions that we all experience can be rooted in joy. I, abs I absolutely love that. And let's talk about that soon when I'm done with my shtick. But you're, I'm just breaking, gonna, I'm... You're, you're already breaking my, you're already breaking my character. Um, and I did want to throw this out. I'm, I'm actually teaching a course um, for the joy revolution right now called Into the Shadows. We're looking at your shadow self. And like, as someone who is 
the chief disruptive officer of the joy revolution, I myself have to say and own the fact that um, joy is not the singular thing that you want to be feeling 24 um, seven. I'm tall, but tall Ben Shahar says it the, the best. I, I think I love how he says it. He says, if you're only feeling happiness 24 seven, one, you're either dead or two, you're a unipolar sociopath. And so like in many ways, we have to own up that depression and sadness is part of it. Those ups, downs, and all arounds. So Dr. Ozzy, Dr. Ozzy, for those of, and for those of you watching right now, and you're like, I'm not completely happy, Dr. Ozzy. I'm not living in joy. That's cool. That's part of your journey. And also at the same time, if you're feeling like, oh, I'm not like Dr. Ozzy or Cordone, I'm not totally feeling like purpose right now. I was in a job for 30 years and I'm not feeling it, Ozzy. I was in a, um, you know, I, w I, w I was in a relationship for 30 years. I'm not feeling it, Ozzy. That's cool. That's your heart beats just like Dr. Ozzy and me. If you're feeling that right now, give us a thumbs up. Let it wash over. Jorge, it's good to see you back. You better be interacting with the show right now. And here's the last part before we go into Dr. Ozzy's story. Hope. Hope. Not from the standpoint of getting on your knees and saying, Dear Jesus, Jesus, give me a new car. Because when you give me that new car, then I'll drive all the orphans in my town around in my new Ferrari. No, it's not about wishing for things to change. It's about actually having the clarity about what your future looks like. And we were talking about this pre-show and we were talking about our own gremlins and being able to move past your gremlins and into that clarity by taking sustained action. So if you are using what I call hope theory, it's as powerful as EQ and IQ. It matches up with Dr. Ozzy's mind. Her IQ is pretty high because she's, uh, she's got a pretty nice uh, doctoral doctorate degree in education. Um, so if you're feeling hopeful right now, there's another button down there. It's called the wow face. And I want Dr. Ozzy to make the wow face with me right now. Dr. Ozzy, show me that wow face. <laughs> amazing, amazing. And given that... The floor is yours to start out, Dr. Ozzy. I want to know from your perspective, what's your story? I am just laughing and crying. I don't even know where to start. But I'm looking, I'm looking at you in this position, kneeling and, and you know, asking whoever you asked yeah. for what you wanted, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and what you said about, what, did, what were your exact words of aligning, creating a vision, right? Yeah, clear it. Yeah, I like yours better. <laughs> and today, it's so funny because just today I was recording this course that I'm going to keep referring to mm -hmm. on joy and purpose and spiritual connection. And I was talking about the fact that so many of us want to be happy and we want to experience joy and we want a great life. But perhaps we've never sat down to paint a picture for ourselves of what that would look like. So oftentimes what I do in my masterminds or my meditation classes is I have everyone close their eyes and our listeners can do it now. And imagine yourself waking up in a year's time perhaps and opening your eyes to the morning and stepping out into your life, putting your right foot down and noticing what this life looks like, what your day looks like. What would it feel like? with every one of your senses to walk through your day, where would you be living? What would your room look like? Who would you be with? How would you spend your time? Where would you go? What messages would you want to share with the world? What type of work would you want to be engaged in? And, you know, you can use this as a meditation. You can spend some more time doing it. But I think it's so important, bottom line, to visualize what we want in life. And what's fascinating is that there's so much research now talking about the power of visualization and the power of what we experience in our mind to actually train our brains that that is our reality. Mm -hmm. So we can do it for, for our lives in a year's time or 10 years' time, or we can do it for tomorrow morning. That's or in five minutes from now. Uh, amazing. Well, I, I did a year, a year from now, and I realized that I'm going to cancel my show a year from now. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. You can't I'm cancel so me. glad you can't. I made the cut. You can't you know? cancel me. We're going 500 deep, people. Um, <sighs> I, I want to talk a little bit about the visioning, right? 
because um um you know some people are like oh that's totally woo woo bull crap um you you have to understand the parameters of life you have to understand um that that stuff doesn't work from your studies and from your um from your experience what is this power of visioning and and why is it so effective all right so i can definitely relate with anyone who thinks that envisioning a new reality is woo because it definitely sounds a little bit like a fantasy I, I can see that i can hear that at the same time we can look into medical research for example there are studies of people who wear arm casts okay for 12 weeks half of the participants wearing the cast will visualize themselves doing weightlifting exercises with that arm for 12 minutes a day the other half does nothing At the end of the study Guess what happens? The people who visualize the arm doing strengthening exercises were 50% stronger in that arm. So it sounds woo, it sounds crazy, but the power of the mind is incredible. I love it. And I love the fact that you're bringing up empirical data on this show um, because definitely, I mean, um, I, I had the, the honor of being a neuroscience, uh, neuroscience major uh, as an undergrad. And Amazing. One of, one of the things that they first did with us was um, an exercise where, like, you envision a lemon and it's in front of you, and your mouth starts watering, right? Um, and you start, then you you Im imagine biting into it, and you actually feel, you know, the little, you know, when you bite into something sour and your mouth puckers. I'm already it. feeling it just listening to you talk about a lemon. Right. It's and it's not because like I'm this magical person. It's more so because the brain. There's parts of it that don't know the difference between what we call reality and what we call fantasy. And so, um, if you know, if, if you're actually going through the uh, going through the steps of envisioning, you are. I wouldn't say fooling your brain, but you're putting your brain in a place where it's comfortable with this new future. Um, Cher, Cher Gardner, I see you. Um, there are alternate versions of you existing right now. Oh my gosh, living the life you want. Everything is now. Decide what version you want to be. Cher, it's been a long time since you've been on the show, but like she's going super deep on us right away as these multiple versions of us, the multiverse, right? Um, and so there's, there's a lot of different versions um, living like that. But if you go right to the brain, you can't ignore the fact that in so many studies, visioning is such a big piece for um, uh, for making massive changes in your life. Now, absolutely, uh, you know, there, it's being used with athletes. Absolutely, yep. And and it works. So I think the whole woo myth can be taken down right about now, and we can envision anything we want in this world. And and the more we believe in it, and I think that's. What I really want to impart is that the more we truly believe in it from a deep place, the more we can manifest it. From a vision perspective, what is it that you believe that we haven't seen manifest from you yet? What do I believe that you haven't seen manifest from me? Yeah, from your, like, I want to, I want to peek into your visions. You know, wow, well, Mark, there's so many. There's so many. You know, I, I think I envision a world where we can communicate authentically with one another, where we don't have to fear the other anymore, where we don't let words become walls in between us, meaning I don't let the label that you're called or I'm called get in the way of, get in the way of us having, having a human connection. So that's a huge part of my vision. So I, I, and, mean, I mean, it's it's already amazing. Um, <laughs> and so, given that this is the first time that we're talking, literally that we're talking, how do you see yourself as an actor in that in that change, like in that universal change? So I, I think about it a lot, and I think you know when we say universal, universal can mean something in this moment, right? Yeah. It can be me sitting down with a friend or taking a walk with a friend and, and hearing all about her dream and her vision and expressing my belief in her. It can be sitting in a circle and 
hearing the vulnerability of participants in an event or a meditation retreat and listening with empathy to those vulnerabilities and being present with what other people are going through, whether it's happiness or sadness or depression or fear or anxiety, a world in which we can all be present with the myriad emotions that we experience. And I think that I've come to a place within myself where I'm now able to do that. I'm able to sit with my own emotions, sit with other people's emotions, and that's something I'm trying to share with other people and teach other people to do as well. Mm, awesome. So I, I want to know, is it, is, has it always been like this for you? Like the, there's a kind of a, a, a high consciousness that's coming out from, from Dr. Ozzy right now. Like what was little <laughs> Ozzy like? And by the way, you, you, didn't grow, so, you didn't grow up in, in Israel, right? I didn't grow up in Israel. Okay. Mm -hmm. I grew up in, oh, I was going to ask you about this actually, because I saw Santa Monica on your profile. Yeah. California, is that where you live? No, I was, I was in Santa Monica for a while and, and, and I'm in Florida now. Yeah. I love Florida, and I love Santa Monica. So I grew up in Southern California in a little town called La Costa, Carlsbad area. It's like Legoland is the famous uh, place on the map. Yep. And I was definitely a pretty deep kid, but I didn't always have an outlet for it. So it was a journey. Talk about that, like being a deep kid but not having an outlet for that. I, I mean, I'm already, I'm, I'm already feeling... Um... Like, I'm already feeling a, a sense of like, ooh, I'm different. One of these things is not like the other. Um, but I don't know if that's, if you were deeper than that, like you probably felt a connection. But so like, what, what did that look like to be a deep kid with it, without an outlet? So in a certain way, I was raised to be deep. I had, my dad was like giving me Dale Carnegie books from the time I was 10 and I went to a, a synagogue, like a reformed Jewish synagogue, and I used to read these like really deep books that they had, and I always loved nature. I definitely had a lot going on in my, in my head, and I think that my struggle was, because of that, I didn't really feel connected to like the football team, or like the, the mascot of the school, or like these really micro sort of constructs that I was within, because I was always thinking about the world at large and so in a certain way that's isolating you know when you're growing up and and everyone's like cheering for the football team and you're just kind of like sitting there and like staring up into the sky sure sure and 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 like at what at what point was this something that you really leaned into and you were like yeah this is the this is my changing point for me because it's like literally it's 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 one thing to have gone through everything and worked your way up to a doctorate degree, right? And essentially, if you wanted, you could, you could be an organizational behaviorist, you could be a, uh, you know, you could, you could easily be a, a, a professor, and you're going into things like joy and purpose and spiritual connection. Uh, you're looking at meta stuff, right? Um, and and, and I, I, would, I would dare say that you're, you're not living in a status quo. You could be status quo by being a doctor and doing achieving all these things, but still, I'm I'm looking at your bio and nothing about your bio is status quo. <laughs> so, like, at what point, Doctor Ozzy, was it like, okay, this is this is where I'm going to let everything inside out? You know, it's interesting. I think it's recent. It's okay. recent, but in a certain way, when I look back over the course of my life, you know, in my childhood. I learned about spirituality and I used to go to like these local meditation gardens of the Self-Realization Fellowship and speak with the people there and I would speak to people from Baha'i faith and I learned world religions and I, I met with pastors and rabbis and I was always interested in what's out there. So I was always on this like spiritual journey and I think more recently when I was finishing up my doctorate, I was living in LA, and I was thinking that at the end of the doctorate, 2015, I would not, I would segue into teacher education, which was essentially what I was studying. I got into beliefs and rituals and all these meta concepts within that program, but my program led to uh, teaching teachers. Okay. But I decided to move to Israel instead, and. <laughs> 
and uh, and 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 it had been it had been a long time coming, but there was this crossroads, and I made a choice to move here. I was still sort of thinking I would get into teacher education and and work in my quote unquote field, but as days passed by. I had a baby in the last couple, I have a two-year-old son, so I was pregnant, I was actually on bed rest with the baby, I was sick, and I was also simultaneously working on writing my first book. And over the course of writing the book, I discovered that there's this whole side of myself that's always been there. Like, I, I remember that when I was in high school, I had a, a job working in a psychic spiritual bookstore, okay? So... I used to, to, to go in, talk to the psychics, and read the metaphysical books, and, and I loved this whole world of spirituality. I've always loved it. And I began to re- remember things like this, and, and I, I so tuned into the material that I was reading and writing about that it became clear to me, this is what I want to do, this is what I want to share with the world, and uh, that's the story in a nutshell. Yeah. That's that's pretty amazing. And so I want to go I want to go into it, so like... Why, when you chose to come on the, the show, talk about joy, purpose, spiritual connection. Why those big three? And we can break them up because those mm-hmm. are obviously huge pillars. Um, but you had carte blanche as to what you wanted to talk about on the show. And like when I saw psychologists, sociologists in education, I was like, oh, we can totally talk about how like education has led to like social conformity and all this stuff and like we could talk about um you know uh how all these systems are 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 causing people not to have joy and blame it on other things right that a lot of uh folks in education do right when sometimes there's a problem in in and of itself that can be improved but why joy let's talk let's start with that Aside from the fact that you're coming on the golden mic and you're talking to the Joy Revolution guy. I know. So get this. This is so incredible. Tonight, right? So we're talking about my book that has Joy in the title. Your book has Joy in the title. And later on, I have someone coming on my show that has Joy in his title. So oh my God. it's like this joy, tryout of Joy today. It's joy bingo There's Joy everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. And, uh, and it's a great question. So why the three? So over the course of writing the book, I was inspired to write this book for the following reasons. I come from a pretty diverse family. I have within my family people of different religions, and I have friends from different backgrounds, different religions, who have all sorts of different belief systems. And I've gotten very into my own Jewish heritage. After exploring a lot and going out and and doing a lot of searching, I found what was in my own backyard, and I've gotten very deeply into it. And I live now in Israel. I live in a in a small town that every Sabbath closes. There's a gate that closes, and there's no cars. We all walk on the Sabbath, and we have all these rituals and traditions that are that are really special and really deep. And I have a shelf of books that are written in Hebrew or written with Hebrew words throughout them, and. I love them, and I love learning these ideas. And in doing so, I have felt for a long time that there's this gap, right? So in education, you talk about an expert-novice problem. There's a gap between these texts that are from the experts, full of Hebrew, and then individuals of all different backgrounds who might want access to these universal insights but don't have the prior knowledge, the Hebrew or the cultural knowledge, to access them. So because I came from this very secular place, very diverse uh, place, I I recognized a need. And I wanted to be a bridge between these really deep, incredibly spiritual books and teachings and people who can benefit from them but might not be accessing them naturally. I I think that's so amazing, too. Um, I, you know, I I think when you're in a PhD program, one of the things that can happen is that you get... Um, so pulled into the the analytics, the empirical data, the verbiage, the training that you end up putting out something that kind of um, you're like, oh, I've I've done a lot of damage in terms of uh, you know finding this null hypothesis to be false, but no one understands it. No one understands it because it's it's so like s- strewn with verbiage. It's so strewn with like things that um, if you if you call it a town gown relationship, right? That the town doesn't understand at all, you know? Exactly. That's that's exactly the expert novice problem. Mm. 
Mm. Um, and I think it. I, I think in education, it's it's a huge thing. But I, I I think that anytime someone is moving up the field of mastery, right, and, and um, we're trying to put words to experiences, uh, we're looking at phenomenology and stuff like. See, I'm putting words to experiences and then discounting other people, right? But like, people people will get excluded from 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 words use when we use certain words words are limiting 100 yes. percent by nature yes absolutely and and we've got shelly brown who's got her clothes back on um saying word <laughs> so <laughs> you've got the hashtag word campaign going so Aww. let's talk about this word that's called the that's called the segue um let's talk about this word joy what is what is the big deal about joy I'll tell, tell you what the big deal, deal is, Mark. And this is what I think the big deal is. I want to hear from you as well. But I think the big deal is that we have up to 120 years to live on planet Earth. So why not enjoy them? Mm. And we're going to go through a range of emotions and experiences. And I think that underlying all of them is is spiritual connection and this this knowing that we've been created by something greater than ourselves that nobody understands and that we are such fascinating and complex beings that we go through ups and downs in life and that no matter what we feel and no matter what thoughts we notice we are pure souls we're beautiful creations and we can embrace all sorts of different feelings with the knowing that we're deeply rooted in joy. Mm. Mm. I like it. I'm changing my program around. <laughs> and I, I love what, uh, where I, where I, I agree with you. This is where I'm going to tell you where I disagree with you. No, I, I don't disagree with you. But where I, where I completely agree with you is that um, people will not make a distinction, since we're talking about words, between the word joy and the word happiness. Oftentimes, happiness is the acquisition of something, like I want to go and drink this Perrier, right? And when I drink my Perrier, it's going to release dopamine. And when, I, when it releases dopamine, and when I see these people hitting the hearts, dopamine gets released, and that's happiness. I, I acquired a goal. But joy is more of an internal thing. It's, it's, uh, it, it, it's more of this feeling of contentment um, with, 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 with who you are, what's going on in the world. And you can also be unhappy about social situations, but still be living in joy. Like, I think a lot of people think that you, if you're joyful, then you're a, you're a complete lunatic to do social justice work. I think it's an even better place to do social justice work, because you can have controversy with civility, rather than, like, fr being fractured. So that's my take on it. A hundred percent. It makes so much sense to me what you're saying because you're when you're rooted in purpose and when you are clear on what you believe and what you believe is right and what your vision for a happier, good world is, you can disagree with people and you can choose not to accept the status quo or the reality that you see and you can work against it. But it's coming from a place of groundedness and, and inner knowing what truth is. Mm, I love it. I love it. So I want to move to the next one then, um, because I mean, there's so much that we can talk about when it comes to joy. Um, and if, if, if anyone has questions about joy, definitely run in right or type in right now. But I want to go into this idea of purpose, because that's another one where people are like, OK, I don't know my purpose. And then there's you see things like purpose in, in three steps. Um, like, what is your take? on joy and purpose coexisting and why they need to coexist or why they don't need to coexist? Yeah, I think it's an amazing question. So I'm going to take like a three second break to plug my computer in because it has 17% and I'm going to answer your question okay. after this short break. Okay, so I, I wanted to, for those of you who are tuning in, John, Denise, Shelly, uh, who are joining the watch party right now, um, yes, the Golden Mike is back. We're running to 200 episodes. We've got Dr. Ozzy Yankovic with us today. Um, and we're talking about joy, purpose, and spiritual connection. Um, author, she's, she's a coach, uh, definitely got her PhD. She's got her stuff in order. And then the whole time, like, bombs have been going off in Israel a couple uh, weeks ago. So we've been going back and forth talking about life, um, talking about esoteric things, and hopefully being able to give you a couple things that can help maybe with some insight to 
for you to uh, take some practice, praxis, that's what I call it, um, theory into action. Um, so, welcome back. Are, are, do, we, do we have our Thank power? Thank you so back? much. Yeah, we're, we're good. We're at 18% now. Oh, we're going 18%. up. 18%. We can, we can continue the show. So, so, talk about this idea of purpose. So, I think that a practical takeaway for anyone watching, for all of us, is that when we take the time to quiet our minds, right? A lot, there's a lot of thinking that goes on. We can become habituated to pay attention to our thoughts because our thoughts, in a lot of ways, are what get us through school, get us through the education process. We, we learn to think critically, right? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, critical thinking, especially when it comes to ourself and our hopes and our dreams and our idealism, is not always helpful. Those are the gremlins and the, 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 the voices of doubt. So we want to we wanna acknowledge that those are there and we want to just pop them like they're bubbles that, that, and, and, and go forth. That, right? makes, that makes so much sense because um, those those voices of doubt can become a shroud for what's real. Before we were talking about Plato's cave, like how did we talk about Plato's cave three minutes before the show? But like, <laughs> you know, this this sort of idea that like, what's what's real, what isn't, and where does your purpose fit in? Um, how much do you subscribe to the notion that we are born with purpose? I believe it. Okay. I, I believe that we're we are born with purpose. And I think that what happens is that over time, we have a naturally built-in defense system. Meaning, as humans, we're wired for survival. We're wired to live. Mm. And as such, we're wired to protect ourselves. And we can protect ourselves out in the jungle if there's, you know, a wild lion coming our direction. We're going to defend ourselves, and we're also going to learn to defend ourselves if one of our siblings gives us a dirty look, or if our parents are upset with us, or if we go to school and we ask a question and people laugh at us. We're going to learn not to express really authentic parts of ourselves because we're trying to protect ourselves from being hurt or being threatened by people, right? So we learn to build this lens, this wall, if you will, in front of our vision, and we're no longer able to see the world without seeing ourselves, our ego imposed upon that world. Because we're just looking at a, a reflection of ourselves in these foggy glasses. And so as soon as we can get to know ourselves and realize, well, why was it that I stopped speaking my mind? What was I afraid of? Am I safe? And, and once we learn to realize we're safe, and even if we get that dirty look or people laugh at us or whatever it is, we can still do it and we can do it fearlessly and we can remind ourselves that our why and who we are and what we were created with and the purpose that we were given is so much more powerful than what anything or anyone out there has to say about it good or otherwise uh, i absolutely love it again why why don't you give me less compelling arguments so i can disagree with you today because i've really been on a nice little disagreement tear on the show but I why are you so wired with your critical thinking let's Work through this right now, Mark. Okay, okay then, then totally coach me on this, you know? But like, cool. um, you know, but I, I absolutely agree with you. I absolutely, I, I, I don't know, I must say, I don't know if we are born with the exact purpose, but I, I do know that when we allow fight or flight to take over our lives, then all of a sudden we start creating masks and personas, right? To, yes. to hide, really, and, 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 uh, much of my adult life has been taking off mask after persona after mask after persona and then thinking that I'm real and being like, oh, that's another persona that I had on. That's another persona that I had on and just continuing to unravel and realize like, I, I, I don't even have words at this point to describe what it is that I'm doing except for I know that it's the right thing because my gut, my heart and my head is telling me to do it you know and then my persona of being a golden mic host comes in to be this somehow critical person that needs to entertain people when the reality is i have an opportunity to just sit here and get to know ozzy in a way that i've never gotten to know you before this is so meta i love it <laughs> I, I love it and it's 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 interesting to think about like how we've been trained to see ourselves like what parts of ourselves people have come to us to find like maybe people came to little mark to get entertained or people came to ozzy for 
I don't know, whatever they were coming to me for. Um, and, and we learn, like, who we are through other people's eyes. And, you know, it's all fascinating, but when you mention about, about your inner knowing, I think that's what spiritual practice is, and I think that's what this can, activities that are there to connect us with our deeper selves and, and, and quiet the noise, quiet the thinking. You know, there's so many thoughts, whatever it is, 60 or 80,000 thoughts that can uh-huh. go through the brain on a daily basis. And those thoughts are not who we are. They're just there. And, and I'm really pumped right now about meditation. It's like I've been talking about it for the last year, and I was allergic to it a year ago. Okay. <laughs> It was the last thing I wanted to do, wanted to hear about. I wanted nothing to do with it because I didn't want to sit in silence. I had too many thoughts. There were like 80,000 of them. I was, you know, like everybody else. But as soon as I I tried it and I tapped into the power of it, I came to so many realizations about that and about so many other things. Um, I'm off on a tangent. No, you're not. You're absolutely not. But uh, but but doing. for me, the bottom line is why is joy so important? Because there's so much suffering that can go on in daily life, and you know it's so interesting. If you'd asked me this question a year ago, I might have started talking about relative joy and relative suffering, saying, "Oh, you know, I'm suffering because I have so many thoughts in my mind, or I'm so anxious, or I'm so depressed." But some people are living it with starvation, or some people lived through the Holocaust. Now, I came across the work of someone named. Dr. Edith Eva Ager this past year. She was on Oprah, and she's 92 years old, and she just wrote a book called The Choice. And she says the following thing. She says that, I mean, this favorite interview on Oprah of all time in for me, but what she said in that interview and what she says is that in every moment, we choose what we're going to put in our mind, and nobody can take that away from us. And she says, you know what? She says, right now, in the year 2019, people are living in the Auschwitz, the, the death camp of their minds. And this is a woman who lived through that death camp. She, she, she was so close to death more times than we could ever even imagine. And here she is at age 92 telling people who were never even there that they're living in the Auschwitz of their minds. And when I hear her speak, I'm like, yes, that's it. Suffering is not relative, mm. and and we can suffer. We can live a first world, you know, we can drive our nice cars in our air-conditioned homes and have every single thing we want, the Perrier, you know, and the <laughs> champagne, and the, it's nothing is going to come That's from actually, the material world it's alone. <laughs> it's, it's, we can it's, have it's the vodka, of vodka, you know, whatever it is, it's like... You know, we, we might think, like, our next acquisition is going to bring us happiness, but all of those things are fleeting. Now, we can enjoy them, right? But there's a deeper knowing and a deeper awareness that comes with enjoying them and, and elevating them to me, in this world. To me, Edith's work and what you're talking about right now, it's very Viktor Frank, Frankl-ish. Yep. And so when you're talking yep. about the Auschwitz of our mind... Um, and it's it's kind of a, a, a very similar piece to what he talked about. And he talked about, um, uh, rather than saying choice, he talked about freedom. And, and the greatest of our freedom is being able to choose the fact that we're not going to be affected by these inputs in our life, right? Like, I've definitely seen people who are like, Mark, how, or I'm like, hey, how are you doing today, uh, Dr. Ozzy? And this is not Dr. Ozzy, this is a, just another person, right? And they're like oh, it's such a shitty day because it's raining on me today, right? Well, you're technically making a choice to allow the day to be shitty because of the weather. And if (laughs) if you're that out of control, then how can you ever experience joy as a choice? You you think that joy... 100%. And that's how, like, joy becomes something that people think, well, I need to pursue joy. And they never become truly happy or joyful because they're on a, a treadmill. Yeah, of chasing, 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 and really, what what it's in many ways what some it sometimes becomes is joy as really this addictive behavior to dopamine rushes, and that's not what thinking joy that it's to me. right thinking it's going to come from the next thing or the next experience. But unless we train our mind to be happy right now and to learn to appreciate that rain, we're not yet cultivating appreciation. Mm-hmm. So. I think it all starts right now. I don't think it's about something out there or, or the next thing, per se. I think it's, it's always. It's in this moment. Mm. 
Why do you think we choose to be in suffering? When we you know, it's an interesting question. Why do we choose to be in suffering? Like, I, I think that I want to define terms a little bit because I do think that, that sadness or grief, certain of our emotions are, are really healthy and, and, and need to be experienced and need to be felt, right? So I think there's a difference between losing a loved one and really going through a grieving process, which is necessary, or, you know, waking up and being really bummed out that it's raining and letting that ruin your whole day when nothing else is is you know so so bad <laughs> so in terms of that kind of suffering it's like why do we do it you know i think that um it could be for so many different reasons and the one thing that i, I heard recently was that people when they hear the word joy they're actually afraid of it because they think that if they get it it'll end mm. that it's not sustainable okay Okay. So, you know, maybe maybe being bummed out about a, about the weather keeps us in our comfort zone or, or keeps us from facing deeper deeper ideas or from being vulnerable and talking about what's really going on. Sure, sure. Um, I, I think we're, we're, we're coming to something that kind of activated – you're bringing out my story now. Like, we're coming into something that activated me and uh, – in terms of where I was at in my progress, I was in a PhD program and I was going through developmental psychology at the time. Um, and a lot of it is like um, based on like sociopathy and stuff, right? Like the things that are going wrong. And um, I remember reading a book called uh, The Regrets of the Dying. And like it was this, this, uh, this end of life nurse had been talking about how she had seen hundreds of people at the end days of their life and they had like five things that they constantly said over and over again. I wish I pursued a, uh, I wish I pursued um, a career that was m more fulfilling to me. I wish I spent more time with my family and my friends. Um, it, was, it was like very basic things that you hear about in like kindergarten, but things that people never even talked about until they were at the end of their life and saying, why the hell did I decide to live here knowing that the whole time like my life was higher than that and like ugh. and i was like i don't want to do that i don't want to live a life like that i want to see theories and i want to see like ways that i can actually take action on that now and so that's what led me into positive psychology and by the way positive psychology is not the answer for every fucking thing um uh, that, that means happy, right? Um, and I also think that for those of you watching, I think that there's something even higher than uh, uh, positive psychology, and it's spirituality. And if it's cool with you, I want to go into that piece right now, because you've got this like triumvirate, right? Of like heavy metal stuff that people go through. Joy, purpose, and then this idea of spiritual connection. Like, what have you, what is your take on spiritual connection why is it important for the joy and the purpose? Um, is it completely independent? Or is it, how is it, how do they all integrate at this point? Because you, you've got a machine in front of me that's forming now. Yeah, I, I think it's an incredible question. And I think that when we talk about language, we talk about words, and we talk about anything in this life, right? By using words to describe it, and in essence, we're, we're limiting that thing, whatever it is, okay? So I think oftentimes we're raised in institutions or learning ideas about the G word, right? About what people call God in ways that are inherently limiting. People will give uh, and the qualities, human-like qualities to whatever created us, right? Talk about, uh, talk about God with a pronoun or, or say that God is um, angry or, or kind or compassionate or give this being characteristics and use words to describe it. I think so often people are just not buying it. They're just not, it, it doesn't make sense. And I believe that that's for a reason. Okay. And I believe that, you know, we've all been created by something so so profound, we can look through every science book and still not find the answer. Like nobody knows, right? We don't know. We're we are all children in this existence. We don't know. And my own conception of God, after you know looking through many different religions and so on and so forth, is that 
truly we're part of a oneness, all of us, you, me, everyone watching, everyone on this planet, all of life, all of creation, we are part of an indescribable oneness. And within my own religion, the, the spiritual masters talk about the goal of life is to, to, to be within this oneness and to have attachment with it. To Literally the, world is, the word in Hebrew is dvekut, which means attachment, but the, the modern Hebrew word for glue is devek. So it's kind of like to be glued to this oneness in all that we do. And what it is, Mark, is it's the difference between looking at life and saying, life is happening to me, right? The rain is falling and it's, you know, ruining my day or, or you know, even it's, it, I, I'm a, it's like saying I'm a victim. You know, life is happening to me. I was born. I didn't choose to be born. I, you know, I heard some guy sued his mom for giving birth to him. That's the ultimate victim mentality, right? It's, it's, it's believing that things are happening to me. But when we can wake up and realize that we're within something so phenomenal, this is happening for us. This world is too beautiful to not be happening for us. In all its complexities and all the ups and downs, it's happening for us. And when, when we can learn to have a relationship with that, whatever that is, I think we begin to see miracles. I love this. I, I love what you're throwing out because on paper, your idea of purpose and spiritual connection are paradoxical. Because purpose would be something along the lines of creating um and this is probably an ego interpretation right uh something along the lines of like my purpose has created me as someone who is absolutely essential to this world and gloriously unique from anything else i'm a one in a trillion billion billion zillion things and that's true yeah right if, if you you know, if, if, if you... I'm um, 100, 100 million percent. And also at the same time, you're saying it's true and we are all one in the same. You can be gloriously unique and one mm -hmm. in the same and not have to think about the paradox of that. Because that's... It's not a paradox that cancels it out. It's a glorious paradox is what I'm hearing. 100% we are each parts of a whole and I think that when we can keep in mind the wholeness of of time and space and that you know our interconnectedness is part of a bigger picture right like something might happen to me and I might think that uh, the rain is falling and this is really bad but perhaps because the rain was falling I didn't leave my house and get in the car and I don't know get in a car accident like we don't see the big picture we don't always know what the future holds and I think that by remembering that that we are each glorious gloriously as you said unique we all need each other in that capacity as well because there is no one person who knows it all there is no one person that can do it all there's no perfect person in this universe we are here to further the collective that we are a part of okay together so you brought up the G word um, and so does that mean since we are all collectively part of each other, does that mean that uh, you see yourself as God? Oh, that's so interesting. So, you know, the title of my book is Beyond All Things. And when I think about the creator, the, the mother of all life, I think about something beyond our capacity to describe. And at the same time, something that we are inextricably connected with. So there's a beautiful idea. I talked about it in my book, and I'll share it with you now. In the, the mystical interpretation of, of the Torah, so the, in the Kabbalah of, of the Torah about the creation story. And it essentially says that the creator blew life into the nostrils of Adam. But Adam, in the flesh was more than Adam in the flesh. It was actually a composite of all of the souls that would ever live for all time. And so there is within each one of us a breath of this mother of all life, this, you know, indescribable being, call it the G word or the universe with a capital U, but it is, it is beyond all things and it is like the title of my podcast. Thank you very much. Within us. <laughs> so it's within us. Okay. So that, so you didn't say yes or no. <laughs> when, I, when I asked the yes, no question. So I think you asked me if I think that we, if I think we are God. So I think that we have a 
we have godly sparks within us, right? So it's all about connecting the sparks and connecting the sparks, nurturing the sparks, and uh, tuning into them, you know, and, and, and really remembering where we ultimately come from. And it's both humbling and empowering at the same time. Amazing. Amazing. So I, I want to I wanna ask you this. Um, how much, how real am I? Since, because we are, we're talking about, we're talking about things and, and I, I wanted to come back to, um, I wanted to come back to uh, uh, some of the, the stuff that was being thrown out about the multiverse and stuff like that. And before yeah. we were talking about, we are, we are literally creatures that project out and create things in front of us. And so like, f from the standpoint of like, literally not me as the golden mic host, but as you know, someone who is a part of Ozzy's world, which you created, how real am I? Or am I just this character in your dream? Are you a character in my dream? Um, you know, it's, it, you're, it's so interesting. If we really want to get technical about, you know, what we experience, what can we really prove? How much do we really know about what is real? You know, there's this, this idea, it's this dichotomous idea that comes from also the ancient Jewish tradition. And it says two things. It says, we should remember two things at all times. And the first one is that the world was created for me. Okay? So that's like the perspective that things are happening for me. Now, the second perspective is, I am but dust and ashes. And the way I look at it is this. Okay? I think that in terms of the world being created for me, that's that the world is created for my godly soul. In terms of us being dust and ashes, that's our, our, the physical world that we're passing through, the, the body that we're passing through. You know, that's what's dust and ashes. I think what's the most real about you and me is our inner connectivity, is our inner godliness, and our inner essence that we are, over the course of this lifetime, learning to express mm. as we, we learn and as we grow. Mm. So what happens when we die? That's for next episode. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I am curious, like what, what happens? In, 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 so, in, from that it's, it's, I mean, listen, we have like a, you know we have a minute left until the show's oh, over, shit. but I'll tell you <laughs> that right. How fast did that oh, go my by? God. Um, I would love to I, listen. I'd love to have you in one of my classes I, I love teaching this ancient wisdom it's you know it's my it's my jam it's my thing and we could do a class about the afterlife I have a few phenomenal books about it and uh and I'll give you I'll give you one idea before we go that's that's about this okay so here's your lesson in ancient Hebrew for the day ready all right the word for breath is nishima nishima the word for soul is nishama. They're very similar, right? Breath and soul. Now, their root word is sham. What does sham mean? Sham means there. The word for heavens is shamayim, which has the very same root, which means there. So that in all moments, and with every breath, we can remember that we're a soul and that this is where we're going. It's a beautiful place, according to tradition. It's it's all good. It's all joy, Mark. It's uh, it's infinite joy. It's infinite. Actually, the way that they talk about it, it's like, it's it's infinite bliss, and we create that for ourselves as we go through this world, doing good acts, acts of kindness, and acts of connection, and uh, it's it's uh, it's a beautiful thing. It's really a beautiful thing. I'm gonna take you up on that offer um, in, terms yes! of, in terms of your class. Um, and also at the same time, I'm gonna give a. We're gonna go over time by one minute um, because you you're having me share things that I don't usually talk about. I think this is just me saying an I statement that um, uh, that we are extremely powerful. Look, I'm getting. Uh, you're making me speak my voice now. I, I think that we're, we're uh, these energetic souls that have chosen these meat suits and these situations for specific purpose. And when it's over, we will go back to being our infinite souls. And we will laugh about it. And we will talk about what we learned when we chose to forget some of the things that we got to relearn in the process of this. I wouldn't call it a, a 
totally a game because I'm a human and it doesn't feel like a game sometimes, but in, in many ways, this movie that we've created for ourselves and the actors that we've called in to be around us at this point. I want to thank you, Ozzy, because you're one of the actors that I realize that I've called into my life and I couldn't have had a better conversation today. This is the deal, y'all. www.azrielayankovic.com uh, Azriela, A-Z-R-I-E-L-A, Yankovic, J-A-N-K-O-V-I-C, dot com. You're, you're currently recording a program right now, a 10-part piece, a ten part program. You've got a book. Um, you've got your podcast. We can find it all there. What else can we find on the website? You can find some information about me, about meditations. I can send you a meditation if you're interested. Let's do it. Let's do it. So go to the website. Um, and uh, definitely if you felt something on this one like I did, share this baby out. Social, uh, social media for social good. The kids are coming back. The cursing redheaded Asian's about to leave. But before I do, uh, more than that gold, more than that dark mic you have in front of you, I want you to visualize that a golden mic, Az Azriela, is coming down now. I know you've seen the show before, so you may have seen this moment, and it's your golden mic moment right now. A golden mic is coming down from your ceiling over there in Israel, um, and it's coming to rest in front of you. Now this golden mic has the power um, to transmit and amplify to every sentient being in the multiverse and translate into every single language. Some people won't be able to pick up or are not ready or don't want to hear what you're about to throw down. Other people are ready for what it is that you're about to hear or what you're about to say. So Ozzy, your golden mic is live now. You are so loved, and you are so special, and that's what I want you to know and feel in all moments, because thoughts are here to trick us sometimes, but we are so much deeper than that. We're so much deeper than thoughts or our bodies or this material world. We are deep, deep souls, and we are here to light up this world, to do good, and to do it together. Now I want you to take that golden mic because we're going to hand it off to our, 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 our buddy Rakshima on Friday. Yeah. Um, so we're going to pass the golden mic. But of course you have that golden mic for, with you for the rest of your life and the rest of your time here. But I want you to hold it up. I want you to feel the weight of what you just delivered. Hold that mic. Now smash it before your kids come <laughs> home. Smash that mic. Come on. All that energy that you had in grad school. Smash it. Stomp on it. Stomp on that golden <laughs> mic, Ozzy. <laughs> Ozzy, we're having you back because I want to know what happens after we die. Azrielayankovic.com. Thank you for being on show 191. I'm going to be back on Friday. Ozzy, have fun with your family and your kids Thank tonight you over so there. Thank you so much. I want you to come back. And y'all, this is the final thing that Dr. Ozzy and I have for you. It's a question. If you're feeling happy and you're living in your full purpose, what is your responsibility to change history for the better? Mark Cordon, Azrael Yankovic, Golden Mike 191. See ya. Thank you. <laughs>